Rejoice, episode 18. Who's the impossible person? Hello, I'm Frank Delaney. Last week, we had ideas and sensations. This week, they slug it out. We left it where Mulligan didn't see any harm in saying that Stephen's mother was beastly dead. Well, here's what happens next. Here's the quote. A flush, which made him seem younger and more engaging, rose to Buck Mulligan's cheek. Did I say that? he asked. Well, what harm is that? He shook his constraint from him nervously. And what is death? he asked. Your mother's or yours or my own. You saw only your mother die. I see them pop off every day in the matter and Richmond and cut up into tripes in the dissecting room. It's a beastly thing and nothing else. It simply doesn't matter. I suppose I did say it. I didn't mean to offend the memory of your mother. He had spoken himself into boldness. Stephen, shielding the gaping wounds which the words had left in his heart, said very coldly, I am not thinking of the offence to my mother. Of what, then? Buck Mulligan asked. Of the offence to me, Stephen answered. Buck Mulligan swung round on his heel. Oh, an impossible person, he exclaimed. End of quote. Let me deal with the references first, and then let's consider what's going on here. The words Mater and Richmond, those are two hospitals in Dublin. Mulligan, remember, is a medical student. Interesting that Joyce has Mulligan mentioned those too. The Mater is a Catholic hospital, the Richmond Protestant. Is he saying that the new professional Irishman will straddle both religious persuasions? Not necessarily, though he might accept there was something in that. He was never one to disclaim anything good and interesting attributed to him. The more prosaic fact is that the Richmond took an overflow of indigents and paupers from the Mater which, by the way, was at the other end of Eccles Street, the most famous address in Irish literature, home of Mr. Leopold Bloom, with whom we will yet spend many years. So, Mulligan dismisses Stephen's felt insult by dismissing death itself. You saw only your mother die. I see them pop off every day in the matter in Richmond and caught up into tripes in the dissecting room. It's a beastly thing and nothing else. It simply doesn't matter. Now, I like the use of the word tripes. What's the old joke? Tripe is delicious if you can stomach the sight of it, because it does look a bit queasy. It's the lining of a cow's stomach. I'm sorry, all you vegetarians and vegans. And, of course, Buck Mulligan, like all medical students, dissected cadavers. Now, he goes on the attack. He says, You wouldn't kneel down to pray for your mother on her deathbed when she asked you. Why? Because you have the cursed Jesuit strain in you, only it's injected the wrong way. To me, it's all a mockery and beastly. Her cerebral lobes are not functioning. She calls the doctor Sir Peter Teasel and picks buttercups off the quilt. Humor her till it's over. Basically, he's saying that Stephen pursued his newfound atheism as profoundly as a Jesuit believed in God. Mrs. Dedalus was losing her mind on her deathbed. She thought the flowers on her quilt were real. As to calling the doctor Sir Peter Teasel, I've told you this before. When Joyce brings in something unexpected like that, watch out, he's at it again. Now, it's perfectly possible that Joyce's own mother did think on her deathbed that her doctor looked like the mild old character from the School for Scandal by the Irish 18th century playwright Richard Brinsley Sheridan. But given Mulligan's tone so far, let me remind you, <laughs> let me remind you of the names of some other characters in that play. Now you'll see what Joyce is up to. There was Lady Sneerwell. There was Mrs. Cander. There was Sir Benjamin Backbite. There were two brothers, Joseph and Charles Surface, and two servants called Trip and Stake. So, was Joyce associating his friend Mulligan, stroke Gogarty, with such names? <laughs> of course he was. And Mulligan coruscates Stephen for not humouring his mother, who wouldn't have known which or whether because her poor mind was going. You crossed her last wish in death, he says, and yet you sulk with me because I don't whinge like some hired mute from Lalouette's. Absurd! That's what he goes on to say. Lalouette's was a funeral parlour, an undertaker's farm in Dublin. As to the phrase, some hired mute, do you know about this? I love it. A hired mute was a professional mourner very popular in Victorian and Edwardian times. I've never seen one, but I've met people who have. And my father heard other professional mourners, the keening women, the wailing women, at a funeral in the west of Ireland. They were hired to howl over the grave. He said it was one of the eeriest, most awful sounds he ever heard. 
The mute, though, was hired for his or her long, sad face and pathetic, bereft expression, and mutes were a kind of silent externalising of what the mourners were feeling at the graveside of the wake, wherever. They dressed in black, heavy black, top hats with flowing ribbons, and the women wore heavy black veils and black gloves. Trust Joyce to bring in such a haunting image. One of the many surprises of Ulysses is how often he departs from the cerebral and intellectual and goes for the jugular of the impressionable emotions. Don't think he's saying feel. But, in writing terms, of course, well, that's show business. Rejoice, episode 25, Prayers for the Dying. Hello, I'm Frank Delaney. If you've got your copy of Ulysses open in front of you as you listen to this, you must be saying to yourself, and you'll say it again and again, what in the name of all that's high and holy am I to make of this? After last week's words, while all prayed on their knees, her eyes on me to strike me down, we get this, again, in Stephen's inward reflections. I'll read it carefully. Liliata rutilantium te confessorum turma circumdet, jubilantium te virginium, Chorus sexipiat, ghoul, chewer of corpses. No, mother, let me be and let me live. End of quotation. This is really what many people find the first major stumbling block in Ulysses. Let me explain. These are prayers for the dying in Latin. And since this passage, all gerunds and genitives foxes so many people, and at first sight even puts them off from going any further into the novel, I'll translate it a word at a time. Here we go. Liliata has to do with the word lilies. Rutilantium comes from the verb rutilo rutilare, meaning to shine like gold. Te means you. Confessorum means of confessors. Turma is throng or group or even squad. <laughs> Circumdet from circumdor circumdare means to surround, to gather round. So here's the rough translation of the first phrase. Liliata rutilantium te confessorum turma circumdet. May a throng of priests, shining like lilies, surround you. In terms of the novel, Stephen Dedalus is thinking of the Catholic prayers for the dying that he should have said by his mother's bedside while she was expiring. Remember last week we had, quote, her hoarse, loud breath rattling in horror, end of quote. Now the second part of that Latin prayer, Jubilantium te virginum chorus excipiat. The verb is excipio, excipere, excipi, exceptum, to greet, to receive, to welcome. It can translate, though, in slight variations. All Latin more or less can. But try this. May a delighted or jubilant or excited chorus of virgins receive you or welcome you or greet you. Well, we'd all go for that, wouldn't we? An excited chorus of virgins. <laughs> Here's the full piece. And again, I stress that I give it because it has so confounded readers for so long and so often. Liliata rutilantium te confessorum tu circundat. Jubilantium te virginum chorus exhibiat. May a throng of priests, as shining as lilies, surround you. May a jubilant chorus of virgins welcome you. By the way, quick note here, from time to time in Ulysses, Joyce makes things recur, entire phrases or significant incidents, and he always chooses something you can't help but notice on the page. Not just as you read it, but it arrests the eye, and of course, Joyce being Joyce and a great singer, it also arrests the ear. I'll flag them for you when they come up, and we'll see that Latin quotation again. It comes into the next chapter, or I think it's the end of this chapter, but you'll, you'll know when we get to it. It's touching, of course, of Stephen to reach for or recall this gleaming section of the prayers for the dying, especially as his horror of death shows in the next sentence of his thoughts, ghoul, chewer of corpses, and then his flight from the thought of death. No, mother, let me be and let me live. A ghoul is a being who opens graves and feeds on the dead. You zombie fans will know that. But a ghoul in our times is also, of course, someone who is drawn to images and contemplations of death and corpses. And Stephen has been thinking of how his mother would look if he did see her as she looked in the grave, if she did haunt him. And he knows that by now his own thoughts are ghoulish. Well, what else could you call them? Or so he accuses himself. But when Stephen fights back and refuses to be haunted by her, no, mother, let me be and let me live. Joyce is here, doing all kinds of things. He's echoing directly Homer's Odyssey, book one. He must have had the very text open in front of him. Because there's a scene in there where Penelope, Odysseus's faithful wife, 
Tele Telemachus's mother asks her son Telemachus to have the poets and the singers be less gloomy in the house and be less overt, for God's sake, in their mourning of Odysseus, who, after all, may return alive one day. It's a bit too early to be singing his dirges. But Telemachus tells the mother, he's his own man now, and man of the house while his father is away. He even says, I'm in charge now. It's a very compelling scene. And Homer describes how Penelope stands at the foot of the staircase, digesting Telemachus's orders, and then climbing the stairs obediently to her room. And this is like a double play in baseball, because Joyce then uses the Odyssey's idea of a son's independence from a mother, and from further down in the Odyssey, he takes that on into Hamlet, where, as a sidebar, you'll find the name Laertes, one of the characters in Shakespeare's play, and discussion of kingship. More directly, though, this is complicated. More directly, just as the would-be usurpers would try to marry Penelope, while Odysseus is away, Shakespeare addresses the fact that Hamlet's mother has indeed married a usurper, already married. She didn't do what Penelope did. She didn't wait. Claudius, Hamlet's uncle, brother of the dead, the murdered king of Denmark, is her new husband, her brother-in-law, adding incest to injury. And Hamlet, like Stephen, and we touched on this a few weeks ago, refuses his mother's request that he stop mourning the dead king so energetically and give homage to the new king. And so Hamlet does this, his rather longest, longer version of Stephen's, No, mother, let me be and let me live. Can't you see, if you didn't before, why Joyce is fascinating, weaving, 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 like Penelope at her loom? That's it for this week. Next week, Buck Mulligan is back. Rejoice, episode 15 the worst of Mulligan. Hello, I'm Frank Delaney. Last week you heard the names Cranley and Seymour and Clive Kempthorpe. Now we go back into Stephen's mind, into his stream of consciousness, as he reaches for the memory triggered by such names. Here's the quote from the text. Young shouts of moneyed voices in Clive Kempthorpe's rooms, pale faces, they hold their ribs with laughter, one clasping another, Oh, I shall expire! Break the news to her gently, Aubrey. I shall die! With slit ribbons of his shirt whipping the air, he hops and hobbles round the table with trousers down at heels, chased by aids of maudlin with the tailor's shears, a scared calf's face gilded with marmalade. I don't want to be debagged! Don't you play the giddy ox with me! End of quote. Well, no wonder we find Joyce difficult. That's a stream of thought, a daydream in Stephen's mind, and there are several references in there to be unpacked. Here's the first. Stephen listens to Mulligan's suggestion of ragging Haynes, the Englishman who's in the tower with them, and he compares it to a ragging of which the real-life Maliki Mulligan, Oliver Gogarty, had knowledge during a term he had spent in Oxford just before the events of Ulysses in June 1904. Essentially, Stephen knows what Buck Mulligan is talking about. And so he imagines a student ragging or hazing in an Oxford college, the university to which they all aspired, and yet of which they were irreverently contemptuous. Now here, Joyce actually gets A, a little racist, and B, just a touch homophobic perhaps. A, he mocks the English as a race, and B, he has all the Oxford students speak as though effete. How do we know this? Well, pale faces was the term the Native Americans gave to the white man who oppressed them. To an irreverent Irishman, it would have worked for the privileged English with their young moneyed voices, too. More significantly, you've heard the term beyond the pale or outside the pale, meaning something unacceptable, usually behavior. Now that's a wholly Irish origination. When the Norman barons first began to colonize Ireland in the 12th century, they captured a sizable lozenge of land on the east coast, the coast nearest England, and their territory stretched north west and south of Dublin, by several miles. To protect themselves from the wild Irish out there who might come and attack them at any moment, they erected a fence of high paling posts all around this land they had secured. And this fence was called the Pale. Therefore, unacceptable or wild behavior was beyond the Pale. And the people who lived behind this tall fence, secure as they thought, they were the men from the Pale, the Pale Man, the eventual English. As to the name Aubrey, it was the kind of girly name used by boys to mock other boys for perhaps being gay or certainly effeminate. Aubrey or Mildred or Queenie. 
and as Stephen further imagines the hazing, he sees the effeminate victim hobble around the table, his face smeared with marmalade, part of the ritual, looking as frightened as a calf, and his shirt tails have been cut into flitters by a pair of tailor's shears, borrowed or stolen from the tailor, who fitted out Magdalen College, a tailor by name of Ede and Ravenscroft, they're still there. Just as Magdalen College looks like Magdalen on the page, which sounds like Magdalen on the ear, so Ede and Ravenscroft was known and pronounced sometimes not as Eads, but as Aids. A slight variation on the pronunciation, a bending of the word in England, but in Ireland, the pronunciation would have made a definite move to A instead of E. Ede, Aid. There used to be a grammar joke in Schoolboy Ireland, which is the correct pronunciation, either or either. Answer? Either will do. And what of the phrases, Oh, I shall expire, and break the news to her gently, and I shall die, that Stephen imagines the students to be crying out in mockery of the boy they're hazing? Well, these are harbingers of one of the multiple pleasures of Ulysses, the references to trashy romances of the day and to lovelorn sentimental songs. Joyce uses them all the time, just as he litters Ulysses, as we'll see later, with references to popular culture, advertising slogans, labels from jars of food, newspaper headlines, theatre posters, all human life is there. OK, next paragraph. We're still aboard Stephen's train of thought in the Oxford College, Shouts from the open window, startling evening in the quadrangle. A deaf gardener, aproned, masked with Matthew Arnold's face, pushes his moor in the sombre lawn, watching narrowly the dancing moats of grass harms. End of quote. Do you remember last week's extensive mention of Matthew Arnold, the considerable 19th century thinker and poet? By mentioning him here, Joyce is doing at least four different things. He's mocking him a little, turning him into a gardener, the kind of person who cuts somebody's suburban grass. But he's also praising him as a man of cultivation, yet he's made him deaf to any opinion but his own, presumably, and he's reminding us, the readers, that the word Hellenize, which we had last week, was made important by Matthew Arnold. Oh, and Matthew Arnold, if you look at the old engravings, did have a countryman's face. And into that peaceful scene of a university square with the noise of student jollity, Joyce introduces a lovely word, grass harms, H-A-L-M-S. Now, this could be a typographical error. There were many in Ulysses, but I don't think so. The usual spelling of the word is H-A-U-L-M. It's an old European word, old high German, in fact, for a stem of grass or a stalk, and it probably comes from the Latin word calamus, a reed. But by taking out the U in H-A-U-L-M, Joyce gives us a word that looks and sounds like calm. Now, that's James Joyce in Trumps. Read Joyce, episode 16. Now you see it, now you don't. Hello, I'm Frank Delaney. This week, let's go straight to it. Buck Mulligan and Stephen Dedalus are still in a dialogue. And Joyce is moving the story along, although the word story is probably a bit strong for Ulysses. Here's the next piece of text, beginning with a sentence of inward reflection from Stephen. To ourselves, new paganism, omphalos. Let him stay, Stephen said. There's nothing wrong with him except at night. Then what is it? Buck Mulligan asked impatiently. Cough it up. I'm quite frank with you. What have you against me now? They halted, looking towards the blunt cape of Bray Head that lay on the water like the snout of a sleeping whale. Now, some explication here. Let him stay again, refers to Haynes, the troublesome Englishman downstairs, whom we'll be meeting soon. When Stephen thinks the words to ourselves, he's probably considering, a little sardonically, the political party Sinn Féin high in the Irish consciousness in the early years of the 20th century. The translation of the two Gaelic words, Sinn Féin, is we ourselves. The reference to new paganism, now that's worth a look. The word pagan, by the way, is from the same linguistic family as the Spanish word peon, or the French word paysan, or the English word peasant, meaning a person of the countryside, because they were presumed to be the ones dancing around trees and bonfires and worshipping the sun, the moon, and the mountains. I sometimes wonder whether every generation doesn't declare a new paganism. But the one which Stephen is contemplating here, that was a vogue in the late 19th century, driven by a character 
who's well worth a long look, even though he's now hopelessly out of fashion. His name was William Sharp, William Sharp, and he was a Scottish poet and a kind of philosopher at that intensely romantic time in Europe and Ireland when the ancient pagan past was seen as full of romance and passion and wonder. Sharp edited something called the Pagan Review, and it was certainly known to Joyce and his contemporaries, not least because the poet W.B. Yeats was heavily into it. I could digress on Sharp for another two or three of these broadcasts. I mean, this man had a full literary alter ego in the persona of a woman that few knew about. He gave her the name Fiona MacLeod, and so successful was the disguise that few people knew in Sharp's lifetime. In fact, Yeats preferred the writings of Fiona MacLeod to Sharp. By the way, in that one reflection of Stevens, Joyce links, with no more than a few dots between them, he links the two major romantic movements of 19th century and early 20th century Ireland, the Republican movement and the misty, romantic Celtic twilight. And Matthew Arnold whom he has mentioned in the previous sentence, if you remember from last week. Matthew Arnold tried to get Oxford University to set up a school of Celtic studies. That's how prominent the idea of being Celtic was in the culture at that time. As to the third word in that sentence, the word omphalos, now that's come up a number of times here. Omphalos is the Greek word for your navel. And the place where the oracle was sighted at the great shrine of Delphi was the belly button of the earth, in their view. And Mulligan wanted the Martello Tower in Doki to be the navel of Ireland. One more thing. Get hold of this. I'll repeat the sentence. They halted, looking towards the blunt cape of Bray Head that lay on the water like the snout of a sleeping whale. Now... I've often heard mockery of Joyce about this very sentence. Bray Head is a chunk of headland south of Dublin. It's actually in County Wicklow. It's the edge of County Wicklow. Joyce lived in its shadow for a time when he was younger, and he mentions it twice in Ulysses. It's heading for about eight or 900 feet high. And the mockery about this sentence came because from the Martello Tower in Sandy Cove, people were happy to point out that you can't actually see Bray Head. There was a time when I got into arguments about this, usually late at night, mostly in pubs, when people would question Joyce's famous authentications of the Dublin in Ulysses. Someone would say, ah, he didn't check his facts. And I'd say, rubbish. He was known to write home to friends in Dublin and ask them details, such as how many trees on a certain street or how many steps down to somebody's cellar. And the critic would produce his moment of triumph and say, ha, but you can't see Bray Head from the Martello Tower. Here was my answer. One. Joyce didn't write looking at the blunt cape of Brayhead. He wrote looking towards the blunt cape of Brayhead. And you have to agree, I think, that blunt cape is an especially good description of Brayhead. And point two, I'd say, and besides, consider what he's doing in Ulysses all through the book. He's distinguishing between what we can actually see and what we imagine we might see. This very point will continue next week in an episode I'm calling Ideas and sensations. Rejoice, episode 17, Ideas and Sensations. Hello, I'm Frank Delaney. This week, we touch what I think may be the most important moment in Ulysses, and one of the most significant moments in all considerations of writing. That's a huge statement, I know, but bear with me as I attempt to back it up. Let's go first to the text. Mulligan has been asking a somewhat withdrawn Stephen as they walk arm in arm around the roof of the Martello Tower, what's bugging you? What's your beef with me? Which, given the digs and insults he's been hurling at Stephen, is just, of course, Joyce showing how insensitive a narcissistic Mulligan is. Here we go. Here's the text. Stephen freed his arm quietly. Do you wish me to tell you? he asked. Yes. What is it? Mulligan answered. I don't remember anything. He looked in Stephen's face as he spoke. A light wind passed his brow, fanning softly his fair, uncombed hair and stirring silver points of anxiety in his eyes. Stephen, depressed by his own voice, said, Do you remember the first day I went to your house after my mother's death? Buck Mulligan frowned quickly and said, What? Where? I can't remember anything. I remember only ideas and sensations. Why? What happened in the name of God? You were making tea, Stephen said and went across the landing to get more hot water. Your mother and some visitor came out of the drawing room and 
She asked you who was in your room. Yes, Buck Mulligan's. What did I say? I forget. You said, Stephen answered, Oh, it's only Daedalus, whose mother is beastly dead. A flush, which made him seem younger and more engaging, rose to Buck Mulligan's cheek. Did I say that, he asked? Well, what harm is that? End of quote. Well, a lot of harm, actually. Disrespectful to the dead and to his friend. Disrespectful to the point of obscenity, in my view. Not a lot of explication needed in that passage. What you see is what you get. Another of Mulligan's many throwaway insults. But there's something fascinating in there, too. The point of this week's broadcast. Let me highlight Mulligan's remark that all he can recall is ideas and sensations. Here's one of Joyce's earliest dips into formal philosophy, and that's why I say that this may be the most important reference in all of Ulysses. I mean that. It's certainly one of the most interesting, and this is why. Joyce wrote in exile. He was drawing on an island in which he no longer lived. He couldn't check his facts firsthand and on the ground face to face, and yet he was writing a book about the city in which he was born and raised, and with which he had such a love-hate relationship, and he meant it to be a book of intimate detail. Remember his oft-quoted remark? If Dublin was pulled to the ground, they could rebuild it from the pages of Ulysses. In that remark, and in his writing of Ulysses, Joyce, whether he agreed with it or not, is acknowledging a view of how the human mind works. While he was a student and becoming aware of philosophy, the works of the 17th century English philosopher John Locke were still a hot number in academe. And if you wanted to be liberal, anti-authoritarian, a true believer in the importance of acquiring knowledge in all levels, an advocate of forming your own opinions, a true intellectual rebel in not accepting everything handed down by authority, and Joyce was all of that, if you were all of that, Locke was the man. He believed, Locke believed, that we were born with nothing in our heads, that life would write on our tabula rasa, our blank page. Now, descending from Locke, came arguments that we can never recall a fact accurately and that we can only have impressions, that is to say, ideas and sensations. Obviously, in the time I have, I can only dip the tip of the tip of a toe into these waters that are still swirling after thousands of years of debate. I'm a reader, not a philosopher. And it's a debate that we first come close to in the works of Plato and his great student Aristotle. And that debate was already centuries old by the time they got to it. And the Greeks didn't even have a monopoly on these issues of mind versus body. And it's a debate that will never go away until the day we annihilate our planet. But here, in Ulysses, as so many important universal themes do, it surfaces in a practical, living way and in the first ten pages. Buck Mulligan is accused of perpetrating a really quite awful insult to Stephen's dead mother, and he says that all he can remember is the idea and the sensation that he did, or worse, the ideas and sensations of the moment, indeed of the whole day. Now that's great writing, indisputably to take a massive world theme, a theme at the core of man's daily existence and core issue, and explicating it by putting it into the ordinary social intercourse of two human beings with no trumpets, no fanfares, just the common man at the heart of ordinary humanity in all his kindness and unkindness. That's what makes Ulysses a great book. Good job, Jim. Rejoice, episode 19, Bacon and Hamlet. Hello, I'm Frank Delaney. Let me do some overlapping from last week. It's a little confusing, and I want you to be absolutely clear about it. There was the altercation, remember, because Mulligan had said, unforgivably in my view and in Stephen's view, it's only Daedalus whose mother is beastly dead. And Stephen replied, I'm not thinking of the offence to my mother. Of what, then? Buck Mulligan asked. Of the offence to me. Stephen answered. Buck Mulligan swung around on his heel. Oh, an impossible person, he exclaimed. Well, we know who the impossible person was. Now, read on. Here's another quote from the text. He walked off quickly round the parapet. Stephen stood at his post, gazing over the calm sea towards the headland. Sea and headland now grew dim. Pulses were beating in his eyes, veiling their sight, and he felt the fever of his cheeks. A voice within the tower called loudly, are you up there, Mulligan? I am coming, Buck Mulligan answered. He turned towards Stephen and said, Look at the sea. What does it care about offences? Chuck Loyola Kinch and come on down. The Sassanuk wants his morning rashers. End of quote. 
And there's a lot in that suitcase to unpack. First of all, obviously, it's Mulligan who walked off quickly. But I'm interested in the next three sentences, and for a number of different reasons. Here's the first one again. Stephen stood at his post, gazing over the calm sea towards the headland. Two points here. First of all, there's the suggestion that Stephen is standing guard, a sentry, protecting his own feelings. He's at his post. I mean, there isn't a post there as such, a military post. He's gazing over the calm sea. Look at the words, gazing, calm. He's seeking some calm. He's slowing down his responses to cope with the insults. In the next sentence, though, as he thinks on, it's proving difficult. And his eyes are hazing over with, we presume, anger and pain. Sea and headland now grew dim, and he can feel his pulse, the beating of his own blood in his eyes, veiling their sight, and fever in his cheeks. Now, to me, this is absolutely riveting, because James Joyce had dreadful eyesight. He could scarcely see at times. He had a number of operations for glaucoma, and I've often wondered whether, psychosomatically, he was blinded by the amount of life and language he encountered as he wrote his masterpieces. But... As always with Joyce, there's something else here. Listen to this. Some years ago, because I'd always wanted to, I visited the castle at Elsinore in Denmark, where Shakespeare located Hamlet. I remember thinking, yes, there's no doubt about it, Shakespeare did mean the Martello Tower in Dublin to represent the platform on the battlements of Elsinore. Quite thrilling, by the way, to stand where Hamlet sees Claudius, his treacherous, fratricidal uncle, kneeling at prayer, and wonders if this is the moment to kill him. And now I'll do it. And so I am revenged, Hamlet thinks. But of course he doesn't kill him. And Claudius, never knowing Hamlet was there, thinks aloud of the famous lines, My words fly up, my thoughts remain below, words without thoughts never to heaven go. Sorry for the indiscipline of that digression. Back to Joyce. Let me remind you again of the lines. A voice within the tower called loudly, Are you up there, Mulligan? I am coming, Buck Mulligan answered. He turned toward Stephen and said, Look at the sea. What does it care about offences? Chuck Lyola, Kinch, and come on down. The Sassanuk wants his morning rashers. The voice that has called up is that of Haynes, the Englishman, who has been waking in the night with bad dreams about a black panther and who carries a gun. Remember we had that a few weeks ago? Haynes, the wannabe Irishman who is trying to learn the Irish language. By the way, I think there's a very deep reference lying in here. After the Norman barons conquered Ireland for the King of England in the 1170s, they integrated so profoundly with the native Irish that the king complained they had become, in a phrase every Irish school child knew, including Joyce, he complained that they had become more Irish than the Irish themselves, which of course is what Haynes is trying to be. And then, next, when Mulligan says, Chuck Lyola Kinch, he's basically saying, stop being as rigid as a Jesuit, lighten up, don't take everything so seriously because boys educated by the Jesuits are reputed to think more than once about everything. And the Jesuits were founded by St. Ignatius of Loyola. That's that reference. And Mulligan, when he says, Look at the sea. What does it care about offences? He's saying, This doesn't amount to more than a hill of beans in the grand scheme of things. Now, just like a movie can do dreams better than any other art form, this is one of those things that a novelist can do best and Joyce has just done it there, setting the greater context. Look at the sea, what does it care about offences? And then, to round it off, there's a joke. The Sassanuk wants his morning rashers. Rashers, slices of bacon, as usually served with sausages. But Sassanuk is the Irish word for an Englishman, and it would be typical of Joyce to ridicule his neighbours from across the water by comparing them or aligning them with sausages. Give them hell, Jim. Oh, and by the way, if you have the Irish name of Macaulay or Macauliffe, you're probably related to the real Hamlet, whose name appears as the Macaulay root. The spelling that you would come across now is A-M-H-L-A-I-D-A-G. That's from 10th century Irish literature. Write it down and you'll see it. A-M-H-L-A-I-D-H-E. More rejoicing next week. Rejoice, episode 20, Fergus and Friends. Hello, I'm Frank Delaney. Let's continue. Buck Mulligan is now openly attacking Stephen, who has taken him to task for being insulting. Here's the next piece of text. 
His head halted again for a moment at the top of the staircase, level with the roof. "'Don't mope over it all day,' he said. "'I'm inconsequent. Give up the moody brooding.' His head vanished, but the drone of his descending voice boomed out of the stairhead. "'And no more turn aside and brood upon love's bitter mystery, for Fergus rules the brazen cars.'" End of quote. Do you like the word plethora as much as I do? I heard it first when I was about twelve, and I went around saying it all day. Plethora, 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 plethora. I'm sure I drove people nuts. It means, as you know, a lot. A lot of everything. It came from a Greek word, plethora, and in its original 16th century usage in the English language, seems to have been employed to indicate too much blood in the system. Well, there's a plethora of references in here. Start with Mulligan saying to Stephen, Give up the moody brooding. As you know from these broadcasts, the two great works of literature to which Joyce's Ulysses pays the deepest homage are Homer's Odyssey and Shakespeare's Hamlet, and they're both referenced in that moody brooding remark. For a start, in Book Two of the Odyssey, with Odysseus still away, his son Telemachus takes a stand. He's deep in mourning for his father's absence. He doesn't know whether his father is still alive. And here are all these men besieging his mother, Penelope. They want to marry her in Odysseus' absence. And now they're angry at Penelope for fooling them, because she's told them she'll consider their suits of marriage when she has finished the piece she's weaving at her loom. But, of course, every night she famously unravels what she has woven that day. So she's never going to be finished. Odysseus is her man, and that's it, and that's the message she's sending. The suitors feel mocked by her, and now they mock Telemachus, and they tell him to give up his sad moods and come and drink with them, and they'll get him a ship that'll take him off to look for his father, but for God's sake, enough with the low humour. Which is essentially what Mulligan is saying to Stephen. Second reference, in the first hefty confrontation between Hamlet and his usurping uncle Claudius, now married to Hamlet's mother Gertrude, Claudius and Gertrude both implore Hamlet to stop his mourning for his departed father. Claudius even calls it unmanly grief, and Gertrude says that her son must stop his mourning, because, after all, she says, all lives must die, passing through nature to eternity. How the hell did Shakespeare always come up with the perfect phrase? It's <laughs> sickening. <laughs> so, we're looking here at a theme of mocking someone for mourning the death of a beloved. And then Joyce has Buck Mulligan burst into song. And this is really interesting, because this is from Joyce's own life, and it doubles the reference bet. He was, as I think I might have mentioned, a fine singer, and he particularly admired a poem by W.B. Yeats, from Yeats's 1892 play, The Countess Kathleen. It's a Faustian story about an Irish noblewoman who sells her soul to the devil so that the tenants on her estate won't die of hunger during a great famine and so that they'll be saved from hell because they've already, the tenants, have sold their own souls to the devil. <laughs> I can see that. Joyce loved this piece from the first night he heard it. He even set it to music because he thought at the time it was perhaps the finest lyric he'd ever heard. And when his teenage brother George was ill with typhoid, he sang it at the boy's bedside. The boy later died, and therefore Joyce's inclusion of the song in Ulysses, sung by Mulligan, doubles the force of Mulligan's insult. It'll come up again soon, by the way. As to the Fergus reference, this is great. Fergus, in Irish mythology, is Fergus MacRoy, Fergus, the son of the king, who, like Hamlet, doesn't get his royal inheritance, and who decides, as did Joyce himself, to go away and pursue a life of art and culture, language and music, with his harp strapped to his back. Watch out for this re Fergus reference. It comes back a couple of times, though it'll be maybe eight to ten years before we get to all of them. The poem, by the way, it's not performed in the play anymore. After Yeats had come through his misty, romantic period, he rewrote the Countess Kathleen for a more general audience, and he took out a lot of the more ethereal stuff. But he did publish the poem as a standalone piece in his second, and some would say his most famous collection, the Rose in 1893. So what we're looking at here is another of the many and myriad reasons why I love Ulysses. Why? Because it's a book without brow. Not high brow, low brow, middle brow. Do you know what I mean by that? It may have obscure references and meanings buried as deep as Aztec gold, but they can come from any cultural mineral scene in the world. 
here in no more than 64 words. That's the amount of text I quoted at the beginning. Here is a benign plethora of sources from Homer and his poem, so popular in ancient Greece that men made a living from reciting it, to Shakespeare, whose plays were adored by the unlettered, uneducated men and women of medieval England, to Yeats, who drew on an ancient legend that was first told at Irish firesides. Wonderful. Rejoice, episode 21. Watch this cloud. Hello, I'm Frank Delaney. This week, beautiful writing and some gorgeous literary devices. This next piece of Ulysses is so lovely that I'm nervous of reading it in case I don't do it justice. Forgive me in advance. Here goes. Wood shadows floated silently by through the morning peace from the stairhead seaward where he gazed. Inshore and farther out, the mirror of water whitened, spurned by light-shod hurrying feet. White breast of the dim sea, the twining stresses two by two, a hand plucking the harp strings, merging their twining chords, wave-white wedded words shimmering on the dim tide. A cloud began to cover the sun slowly, wholly, shadowing the bay in deeper green. It lay beneath him, a bowl of bitter waters. End of quote. What are we hearing? What's going on here? Well, I'd advise you to listen for the noise of a train, a train of thought. Stephen is standing at the top of the stairs, about to go down into the bowels of the Martello Tower and be taunted again by Mulligan, or so he fears. He looks out to sea, which Joyce describes using words the way a painter uses white. And because he wants to mimic the sound of the sea ebbing and flowing, he uses the letter W. Eleven times in that first short paragraph. Try making with your lips the shape of W. You get wa, wa. The beginning of water and wave. Wood shadows are floating sea word. And look, there's the painterly touch. In shore and farther out, the mirror of water whitened, spurned by light shod hurrying feet, white breast of the dim sea. Then he inserts a brief waving sound, a hand plucking the harp strings, and here, by the sea, is the only mention of harp strings in the entire novel, although he uses the word harp eight times. And now listen in your head to the sound a hand makes when it's drawn lightly over the strings of a harp. Lovely little political touch here, by the way. Ireland, as I think I've mentioned in the past, is the only country in the world to have a musical instrument as its national emblem, the harp. And, pile on the irony, it is such a difficult instrument to play. As to twining stresses, imagine the harp being played by two hands, caressing the strings in opposite directions, each hand stressing its own strings, and the chords are intertwining, as they do when a poet is working in two opposing directions at once, with, for instance, oxymoron. Now imagine the dark of the shadows and the light of the sea and the overlapping of the waves ebbing and flowing against all those wa sounds from the letter W. The morning is full of sun and shadow coming and going like the waves of the sea. And now listen for the next two references because they also have to do with light and shade, with light and shade in the human spirit. And they move things along in a way that becomes crucial to the rest of the book and important to something deep and painful in Joyce's own life at the time he was writing the book. Jealousy. A cloud began to cover the sun slowly, wholly, I'm repeating here, shadowing the bay in deeper green. It lay beneath him a bowl of bitter waters. Stephen was under a cloud, a cloud of his own mourning for his mother. Joyce had been under a cloud too. A malicious friend in Dublin claimed to have slept with Nora. And Joyce found his own jealousy almost unendurable. And he was so relieved to discover it to be untrue that he made the address of the friend who proved it to him a major address in Ulysses. We'll come to all that in due course. But here for now is the jealousy reference at this moment. And by the way, jealousy becomes a wider theme as the novel goes on and very painful to Mr. Bloom in due course. Green, as we know, which he uses here, is the colour of jealousy, the green-eyed monster, also, of course, the national colour of Ireland. And Joyce uses it just under a hundred times in Ulysses, 98 times in all, I think, shadowing the bay in deeper green. And listen, it, meaning Dublin Bay, 
it, he says, lay beneath him a bowl of bitter waters. Ha! Huh. Now here's a nasty little piece of ancient sexism. If you know your Bible, you'll know that the trial by ordeal for a woman accused of adultery when pregnant was to drink an especially bitter potion, which, if she were guilty, would produce an abortion. If innocent, she'd be protected by God. Now let me think. Would it strain the imagination to wonder if that little statute might possibly have been invented by men? No, surely not. A jealous husband, perhaps? No, not possible. Anyway, it wasn't far. It wasn't the water ordeal used for sniffing out witches. It was a bowl of bitter water. Which is the phrase Joyce uses here to describe Dublin Blay. And finally, back to the cloud that made the bay look that deeper green. It's part of the unifying of Ulysses, and it's a wonderful, wonderful device. It's part of the unifying of the novel that Joyce has different characters in the book observe the same things. Funerals and parades that pass through many streets, five men in a mobile walking advertisement for Healy's The Stationers, and a cloud. This very same cloud that Stephen sees out in Sandy Cove from the roof of the Martello Tower will be seen three chapters later by Mr. Leopold Bloom, Joyce's other main protagonist, as he comes back from shopping for his breakfast many miles away in the streets of North Dublin. Lovely. Read Joyce, episode 22 of Beads and Bird Cages. Hello, I'm Frank Delaney. Slightly longer broadcast this week, here's why. I'm starting with a piece of text that is almost as long a single continuous quotation as I've yet offered to you. As usual, there are some references within it that will need a little explication, but listen in particular for the language and the mood and the memories and the very naturalness of what's described. Here we go. We're hearing Stephen's thoughts. Fergus's song. I sang it alone in the house, holding down the long, dark chords. Her door was open. She wanted to hear my music. Silent with awe and pity, I went to her bedside. She was crying in her wretched bed. For those words, Stephen, love's bitter mystery. Where now? Her secrets, old feather fans, tasseled dance cards powdered with musk, a gaud of amber beads in her locked drawer. A birdcage hung in the sunny window of our house when she was a girl. End of quote. Let's start with the first reference, Fergus's song. We've already dealt with that to some degree last week and the week before. I'm just jogging your memory now. Remember the Yeats piece, Who Will Go With Fergus Now? From his play, The Countess Kathleen. A poem much admired by Joyce, set to music, and sung by Stephen, as his dying mother listened through the open door of her bedroom. He hears her crying at the words in the song he's singing. Love's bitter mystery, that's what's on her mind. And in Joyce's own life, the sons physically fought the father for his brutal insensitivity toward their dying mother at her bedside. And just for a second, Joyce touches on the depth of Stephen's and therefore Joyce's own grief at such an intimate bereavement. Quote, she was crying in her wretched bed. Now... Watch out! <laughs> There's a little squib in there, and let's give the squib the name Aristotle. By the way, the Irish playwright John B. Keane, whose presence on the planet I sorely miss, he told me once that a man near his home in County Kerry had named one of his fields Aristotle. I'm referring, however, to the philosopher. Joyce was more than familiar with Aristotle's poetics, and I think he's invoking him and that work here. How and why? The how comes in that phrase, awe oh, and pity. Part of Aristotle's tenet in the Poetics suggested that tragedy arouses not only pity, but also fear, or awe, if you like. And the why? It is a tragedy. Stephen's beloved mother is dying of terrible pain. The amount of descriptive writing in this paragraph reinforces my point, because Aristotle believed that tragedy was best when dramatized, not on the page, on the stage. He was perhaps the first of the creative writing schools people to say, show, don't tell. And in fact, he actually did say more or less that very thing in the poetics. Here's the quote. Here's the exact quote. Tragedy then, said Aristotle, is an imitation of an action that is serious, complete, and of a certain magnitude in the form of action, not of narrative. 
through pity and fear, effecting the proper purgation of these emotions. Serious, complete, and of a certain magnitude. Well, that describes the death of a loved one. And that's why Joyce has Stephen thinking about it in dramatic terms. And by the way, I don't know if you caught it, there's a crippling two-word sentence in there. It's a separate paragraph in the book. Where now? Meaning, where has she gone? One of the central questions of bereavement in Catholic Ireland. Heaven, hell, or purgatory? And now in the text, almost as stage props, Joyce begins to list such bedroom secrets as anybody's mother might have had in those days. Old feather fans, tasseled dance cards, powdered with musk, a gold of amber beads in her locked drawer, a bird cage hung in the sunny window of her house when she was a girl. Now there's an interesting reference, a gold. My mother had a set, a famous set of rosary beads, and every eleventh bead was large and silver for the last part of the decade, so to speak. And the gold is the bead that jewellers use to punctuate the smaller stones in a necklace with a larger one. The word can also mean a piece of trickery, a device to deceive people. Is Joyce having one of his famous cracks at Catholicism here, and its belief in the afterlife? He will certainly mean the word gold to have more than one meaning. He always does if he can. In this passage, though, I love almost above all the almost cliché of the birdcage. Though, of course, it wouldn't yet have quite been a cliché then. And Joyce, as he always does, doubles down on it. He works the image far more than most writers would get out of it. Look at it. There's Stephen, recalling Mrs. Daedalus, his mother, a year earlier, trapped in her bed by approaching impending death. Obviously, she's imprisoned, as frail and as unfree as a bird in a cage. And who's doing the singing? Not the trapped bird. Stephen is the singer. What's this about? Well, obviously, I think it's about the symbolism of birds in cages. Not the William Blake poem, O Curious of Innocence, a robin redbreast in a cage puts all heaven in a rage, but the symbolism attached to liberty of expression. Psychoanalysts and therapists will tell you, dream of cages and you're afraid of being unfree. Dream of birds in cages, and you're afraid that you're not quite managing to express what's in your soul because it's too powerful or too painful or simply too large to speak accurately at that moment. Like when your mother is dying in front of your eyes and all you can do is sing, <laughs> oh, oh, that James Joyce. What a guy. Back next week. Rejoice, episode 23, Thanks for the Memory. Hello, I'm Frank Delaney. Let's begin with the usual, a quotation from the text, long-ish again this week, to try and keep everything together. Once more, you'll be hearing Stephen's thoughts, although there will then come a moment when Joyce, in a most interesting literary technique, seems to split the distance between the first-person stream of consciousness and the third-person narrator. Or does he? I'll flag it up for you when it happens. Here's the quotation. I'll overlap with a sentence from last week. A bird cage hung in the sunny window of her house when she was a girl. Now we start afresh. She heard old Royce sing in the pantomime of Turco the Terrible and laughed with others when he sang, I'm the boy that can enjoy invisibility. Phantasmal mirth folded away, musk perfumed, and no more turn aside and brood. Folded away, in the memory of nature with her toys. Memories beset his brooding brain. Her glass of water from the kitchen tap when she had approached the sacrament. A cored apple filled with brown sugar, roasting for her at the hob on a dark autumn evening. Her shapely fingernails reddened by the blood of squashed lice from the children's shirts. End of quotation. Now, did you catch it? Did you catch the moment when Joyce moves from stream of consciousness, interior monologue, to a kind of third-party position? It comes in the single sentence, Memories beset his brooding brain. Up to that moment, Stephen's been reflecting to himself on his mother's life. And then Joyce steps back from Stephen for just an instant and becomes the narrator again, and thereby reminds us whose book this is. His brooding brain, not my brooding brain. I think he did it to separate himself from an autobiographical over-identification with Stephen. 
After all, Joyce is describing here what more or less happened with his own mother. The time scale is even similar. Mrs. Joyce died in 1903, a year before the events of Ulysses, as did Mrs. Didulus, Stephen's mother. So, Stephen reflects, goes on to reflect, on how she enjoyed a pantomime in the Gaiety Theatre in Dublin, probably Christmas 1873, when an English actor called Royce, he was Edward William Royce, originally a dancer, versatile, light enough to be in Gilbert and Sullivan, serious enough to dance ballet, therefore perfect for pantomime, that merry look out behind you mishmash of Christmas entertainment involving travesty. The principal boy is old as a girl, the dame is old as played by a man. He started it in Ireland, he brought the first one to the Gaiety Theatre, and it still pulls in the crowds every Christmas in Britain, and, to some extent, still in Ireland. It was a tradition when I was a kid. Usually, a pantomime show is based loosely on an old legend. Mother Goose, or Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves, the one Stephen is now recording, was called Turco the Terrible. Now, why did Joyce choose this, I ask myself? By now, you'll have gathered that I tried to keep a keen eye on him. He's always up to something. Well, Turco the Terrible was written by an Irishman, Edwin Hamilton, whom Joyce probably knew there were contemporaries at university, different universities. Hamilton was a writer of light-hearted, nonsensical pieces for the theatre, and he was a young man about town in Dublin, the same time as Joyce was. And here we have evidence of one of the great Joycean tricks, conflation. He merges stuff all the time. Here we're looking at a pantomime that, as I say, brought the theatrical form to Dublin in 1873. Joyce's mother would have been about 13 years old. So it's perfectly possible that she used to talk about having seen Turco the Terrible with Royce at the Gaiety Theatre. Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Much more interesting, though, is Joyce quoting from Turco's song, I am the boy that can enjoy invisibility. This, to me, is just terrific. If you read across the entire text of Ulysses, you get a sense that Stephen, though always somehow present, is the least prominent of the important figures in the novel, shadowy at best, often barely visible. Is Hamlet becoming his father's ghost? Time after time we have to strain to see Stephen, and even at one stage, in for me, almost the most stunning moment of the book, when Stephen looks in a mirror, he sees somebody else. You'd hardly call that visibility. We come to that sector, by the way, around, I'd say, the summer of the year 2031, 2031. So, hang on. And here's another level. In Hamilton's play, Turco the Terrible, Turco is given the gift of invisibility in a magic rose. Stephen's mother is just about to become invisible through death. Death has its own magic. And let me just tidy up the remaining references from that long quotation. The memories that beset his brooding brain were, quote, her glass of water from the kitchen tap when she had approached the sacrament. In those days, Catholic doctrine required that you fasted from midnight before taking Holy Communion in the morning. You were only allowed water. Here's another quote. A cored apple filled with brown sugar roasting for her at the hob on a dark autumn evening. I remember so well my own mother coring apples and roasting them and filling the hollow with brown sugar or honey. Here's the final quote. Her shapely fingernails, reddened by the blood of squashed lice from the children's shirts. This, I'm glad to say, I don't remember from my own life. Children's heads were often infested with lice in those days, especially if they lived in crowded parts of a city. So, have I picked up everything in that passage? I think so. Let me just look back. No, hang on. I missed one. Ha-ha! Folded away in the memory of nature with her toys. You can't take your eyes off James Joyce. The memory of nature. But this is truly complex, so I'll come back to it next week, because it's fundamental to Ulysses, the memory of nature, and how Joyce created the novel. Read Joyce, episode 24, Don't Be Afraid. Hello, I'm Frank Delaney. Last week, I left a reference unexplained. It sat there for days, tightly packed until I could stand it no longer. Let me begin this week by reminding you of it, and then I'll take it out of its brown wrapping paper, and having dealt with it, we'll soldier on. It came when Stephen was recalling his mother's last days, and he was reflecting on her memories, mixing them with his own. Here's the sentence I didn't unpack for you. Folded away in the memory of nature with her toys... The phrase I'm homing in on is the memory of nature. This, 
with James Joyce is business as usual. A throwaway phrase, an iceberg, gleaming and shining, but with the serious eight-ninths of it beneath the surface. This is what's down there. Memory of nature is actually a known phrase from a number of related works of quasi-spiritual thought and mysticism that appeared in the late 19th century, and it has a damn exciting connection too. I've said before here, and indeed more or less all last week, how crucial memory was to Joyce. It was as flour to a baker. Well, memory of nature was something much in his mind and in the minds of all truth-seekers and intellectuals in his time. Yeats, for instance, danced very publicly among those stars. And it has to do with the theosophical belief, derived largely from Eastern spiritual beliefs, that nature, the world, the planet, the cosmos, has its own memory just like you and me. Nature has her own memory. I love the word theosophy. In essence, it means knowledge of the deeper world, derived from what we call God or the divine, as distinct from the, call it, secular wisdom of life, handed down by the classical philosophers, such as Plato and Aristotle. Joyce, whatever his later attitudes to religion, couldn't not have heard of theosophy. He was, after all, educated by the Jesuits. Here, though, he's including his mother. How lovely is this? He's including his mother in the grand scheme of things saying that her memories are part of the universe's memories. And here, this is very important, here we touch for the first time in Ulysses on a fundamental belief of Joyce's. He believed in the absolute importance of the individual, no matter what the status. I can best describe it by passing on his remark, there's nobody, he said, in any of my books worth more than a hundred pounds. And the stated beliefs of the Theosophical Society? They included the intention, quote, to form a nucleus of the universal brotherhood of humanity without distinction of race, creed, sex, caste, or color, end of quote. So look at what Joyce does in that fragment of a sentence. It's breathtaking. He inserts his dying mother, well, Stephen's dying mother, into the importance of the cosmos. I could do ten broadcasts on this, but I want to hurry along and get this entire exercise in deconstruction finished by the year 2042, in time for my birthday. I'll be a hundred then. <laughs> memory of nature. Well, well. Well, he's certainly part of the universal memory himself, and he drew on it all the time in his work. So, let's move along. Next little segment, we're still in Chapter 1, Telemachus. We're still with Stephen Daedalus. He's still on the roof of the Martello Tower at Sandy Cove outside Dublin. Buck Mulligan has gone downstairs to prepare breakfast, and Stephen is still brooding on his mother's death. And by now, he's a little fearful. Here's the text. Stephen's thoughts. In a dream, silently, she had come to him, her wasted body within its loose grave clothes, giving off an odor of wax and rosewood. Her breath bent over him with mute secret words, a faint odor of wetted ashes. Her glazing eyes staring out of death to shake and bend my soul on me alone, the ghost candle to light her agony, ghostly light on the tortured face, her hoarse, loud breath rattling in horror, while all prayed on their knees, her eyes on me to strike me down. The passage contains little that's obscure. Stephen has dreamed of his dead mother in the shroud in which she was buried, with the embalmer's aroma hanging around her, and she bends down close to him, horrifying him with her ghostly terrors, the ghost candle to light her agony, ghostly light on the tortured face, her hoarse, loud breath rattling in horror. What is this? Halloween's long past, isn't it? But hang on. What have we here? This is no commoner garden haunting. Where have we come across something like this before in literature? Ha! Here's the answer. If you read Act One of Hamlet, especially scenes four and five, where Hamlet meets the ghost of his murdered father, you'll hear the same music, so to speak. The feeling is uncannily similar, and deliberately so, and it intensifies. And we'll come to that too next week. And by the way, because we've now broadcast another dozen rejoicings, on Friday, that's two days from now, we're putting up another bonus edition. This time an airing that I'm calling Close Formation, how James Joyce was formed and shaped. And as I say, the usual weekly broadcast will be up here on Wednesday next. Rejoice, second bonus edition, the formation of James Joyce, Formations. Hello, I'm Frank Delaney. 
Since last week's broadcast brought up the two dozen mark, this is a special edition, a bonus. You may recall that I told you some time ago, after every 12 editions, I'll include a special, not so much a look at the text of Ulysses, but something that illuminates the circumstances surrounding the book. Our first bonus, 12 weeks ago, was about James Joyce's origins. Now I want to talk about his formation, what fundamentally shaped him as a writer, as a literary artist, to be more specific about it. I use the word formation fairly loosely. We'll look at many things. The history and geography of his country, some notes on the kind of education he had, both formal and self-supplied, and some observations about the cultural era that formed him, the influences that were abroad in the world and to which he was exposed. As you've probably seen already, you can trace many of those influences from the words he put on the pages of Ulysses. Let's begin with the country he came from and how it was at the time he was being formed. I realize that I'm making him sound like a rock stratum, a byproduct of the tectonic plates, but he is definitely a geological period all to himself in the bedrock of Irish writing and English literature. Ireland was moving through one of its most interesting periods ever when Joyce was born. The late 19th century offers the beginning of the country's greatest moment since 1167, the year in which the Norman Knights of King Henry II of England landed in the southeast of Ireland and began what would eventually become the colonization of the island. Now, in Joyce's time, after centuries of oppression and denigration and colonization, he was born in 1882, a newfound political acumen had begun to ease those ancient, long-standing, bruising ties. As Joyce was growing up, there were scores of Irish political movements, leagues, clubs, associations, all seeking the way to get independence from the English crown. That welter of political nationalism had an extraordinarily distinctive voice, a means of expression that was at once romantic and political. As I think I've said before, most history is written by the winners, but in Ireland it was written by the losers at its purest, the newfound national voice came from the deep antique past of prehistoric legend and fireside myth. In its loud callings, it represented the four corners of the country. Ireland, you see, was by now four provinces, Munster in the south, Leinster in the east, Ulster in the north, Connaught in the west, 32 counties in all. There had, and you'll know this, you've probably heard this, there had in antiquity been a fifth province, Tara. Tara of the kings, a province not even as big as a county, practically. It's in County Meath, but precious and golden in that it was the sole domain of the High King, to whom the kings of the other four provinces had historically paid homage. Homage, by the way, including taxes. Tara dissolved, though, under the pressure of the incoming colonizers, as did the entire Irish kingship system. One by one, the great chieftains were deposed, either wiped out in battles of their own making, or self-exiled after seeing the writing on the walls of their castles. But... And this is really the point. They left behind them a magnificent heritage of song and story that had existed long before they did, but had been kept alive in their castles at banquets. A heritage of great deeds and the warriors who effected them, of fabulous days in a land of milk and honey, of a time when Ireland was a country of gold and learning. The island of saints and scholars was its self-granted European nickname. All of this history and multiple geographical associations, too, come into Ulysses. If ever you read a writer sensitive to and sensible of his own background and history and geography and social conditions, that was James A. Joyce Esquire. In his daily life, he was reading newspaper accounts of political meetings where the warriors of old were constantly and powerfully invoked. The political associations were named, even named after them. At the same time as this, native outpouring which drew straight from prehistory. He was also seeing powerful contemporary expression. He was watching significant and interesting Irish writers, such as Yeats and John Millington Singh, flex their muscles by writing into this kind of body of ancient literature, by observing the peasantry to whom the literature belonged. There was George Bernard Shaw and Oscar Wilde. They were the giants of his youth, all of them putting pressure on the English language and calling to attention all sorts of belief systems that a burgeoning and newly educated people could think of embracing. You see, up to the time of Joyce's grandfather, education had been banned and even criminalized for the Catholic Irish. It was an indictable offense for a Catholic to own a book. Vigorous politics, though, won back those rights, and James Joyce, 
He was, well, his family, really, they were among the first beneficiaries of this new freedom of thought. Now, Joyce was also aware of the world outside Ireland, and that wasn't typical of every young Irishman of his time. It's difficult to convey the level of deep ignorance in which the Irish had been kept. On the east side, England, the main gateway to Europe, they regarded the island as slave material, a sub-race who stubbornly had refused to be conquered, converted, or assimilated. And if they couldn't be annihilated, they were too numerous and too rebellious, they had to be kept primitive without education or jobs, hence the criminalization of education or owning books. To the west, the new world, America, lay too far away, and whereas it had already, by the time Joyce was born, accepted millions of Irish emigrants, Little enough knowledge came back. The distance was just simply too great. There had been a repeated, if sporadic, contact with the great nations of Europe, France, Spain, Italy, Germany. All of these had historically had political and military issues with England, and therefore there were natural Irish allies. Unstoppably, some of the Irish came in contact with those cultures, and by the time James Joyce got through university, he was more than well aware of the ancient and modern schools of European thought and philosophy. And, as we know, he had a deep working knowledge of Homer. So, what have we got so far that shows in Ulysses? Well, we have this small island of compressed and therefore intense cultures, where the political pot was boiling so fiercely that the lid was about to come off. Ulysses was set in 1904, a dozen years before the climactic rebellion of 1916 that eventually led to a substantial measure of Irish independence. Ulysses was published in 1922, a year after that crucial treaty with England. And it was being written all throughout that period of political tumult, admittedly, though Joyce was abroad. So there is within the novel a new nation on display, a nation with an identity and a personality and a vigorous omnipresent history and looking over its shoulder at where it's been. And much of that mixed identity and most of that cultural personality came from that fabulous, in every sense, ancient mythology, that golden sea of prehistoric legend on which so many Irish people were raised, myself included. In Joyce, circles keep opening, coming full circle and closing. So, let me just list the formative influences so far. Politics, mythology, ancient and recent philosophy. Plus exposure to Europe by means of an awareness of the countries who were Ireland's allies against England and their magical-sounding European languages. Next up, we have Joyce's awareness of the literary universe, of the thinkers and writers of classical antiquity, and the leaders of more modern schools of thought. We know how he stretched Ulysses on the frame of Homer's Odyssey, and we also find, and you've seen this already in the very first chapter, that Ulysses has a close affinity with Shakespeare's Hamlet. We find an awareness, too, of who was who among the writers of the time. He has references to, for example, Matthew Arnold within pages of the beginning. In general, as I'm sure you've already noticed, not more than a paragraph or two goes by without some literary reference or philosophical trope popping up its head. Add in now his own wide reading at school and university. You remember that I mentioned how, as a student, he mastered the Scandinavian dialect of Dano-Norwegian in order to write a fan letter to the playwright Ibsen. That was Joyce all over. He didn't just dip his toe in exotic water. He plunged in the whole foot and sometimes the entire body. I've never counted, and I don't know anybody who has counted, the number of languages he drew on for phrases, linguistic references, or mere fun across his works. But I'm aware of the Romance languages, of Scandinavian references, of little stings from Asia, and Lord knows where else. I've compared Joyce in the past to a pinball machine. Every time you put pressure on his text, some exotic light glows, some merry sound jangles and beeps. Now, all this excavation of the formative inferences, I know, is reinforcing the image of Joyce as arcane, unapproachable, anti-democratic, all the characteristics which, if carried to extremes, prevent us, the people, from learning at the feet of a great master. Now, though, you love this, now comes the redeeming part. Joyce's work, and this will become more and more apparent as we work our way through Ulysses. Joyce's work is full of what politicians call the common touch. He includes references to and snatches from popular songs everywhere. 
He gives us old saws and sayings. There are jokes. There's a really rusty old gag coming up in a week or so about making tea. There are advertising slogans, brand names, newspaper headlines, colloquial greetings. There are bodily functions, descriptions of clothing, and other sartorial concerns. There are slices of social history, remembrances of things past, household details, furniture, food. There are hookers and handsome cabs, louts, barmaids, fruit sellers, lunatics. Now remember, I'm raising here this question. What formed James Joyce? What shaped him and his spirit and his intellect and thereby his work? Answer, all of the above. Tick every box you can think of. This was a man who was recounting life itself as he knew it, and he saw no reason why everything shouldn't be grist to his mill if it was grist to ours. A few chapters from now, you'll come across the phrase in Stephen Dedalus' mind, the hundred-headed rabble of the Cathedral Close. Let me unpack it for you now. It's an oblique reference to St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin, where Jonathan Swift was the dean and was so beloved that the poor people used to gather in a kind of mob or rabble in the cathedral yard, the cathedral close, asking for his charity. They too, those people, they're the influences on Joyce. He wasn't a narrow-spectrum, single-topic novelist. He was, here comes everyone. In an interview before an audience in London years ago, Salman Rushdie told me, that he had written his mighty novel, Midnight's Children, to see whether he could reach a part of humanity that James Joyce hadn't touched. And he said he wasn't sure that he had succeeded. That's the size of the land, the continent, the planet we're traveling in these podcasts, the planet Ulysses. And we're back exploring that vast place in our weekly podcast next Wednesday.